my name is Mohsen Hamid, and I'm reading from my second novel, which is called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And I'll read uh, a longer passage from the very beginning of the book, and then something a little bit shorter from halfway in. <coughs> this is how it begins. Excuse me, sir, but may I be of assistance? Ah, uh, I see I have alarmed you. Do not be frightened by my beard. I am a lover of America. I noticed that you were looking for something. More than looking, in fact, you seem to be on a mission. And since I am both a native of this city and a speaker of your language, I thought I might offer you my services. How did I know you were American? No, not by the color of your skin. We have a range of complexions in this country, and yours occurs often among the people of our northwest frontier. Nor was it your dress that gave you away. A European tourist could as easily have purchased in Des Moines your suit with its single vent and your button-down shirt. True, your hair short-cropped and your expansive chest, the chest, I would say, of a man who bench presses regularly and maxes out well above 225, are typical of a certain type of American. But then again, sportsmen and soldiers of all nationalities tend to look alike. Instead, it was your bearing that allowed me to identify you. And I do not mean that as an insult, for I see your face is hardened, but merely as an observation. Come, tell me, what were you looking for? Surely at this time of day, only one thing could have brought you to the district of Old and Arkali, named, as you may be aware, after a courtesan immured for loving a prince. And that is the quest for the perfect cup of tea. Have I guessed correctly? And allow me, sir, to suggest my favorite among these many establishments. Yes, this is the one. Its metal chairs are no better upholstered. Its wooden tables are equally rough. And it is, like the others, open to the sky. But the quality of its tea, I assure you, is unparalleled. You prefer that seat, with your back so close to the wall? Very well, although you will benefit less from the intermittent breeze which, when it does blow, makes these warm afternoons more pleasant. And would you not remove your jacket? So formal. Now that is not typical of Americans, at least not in my experience. And my experience is substantial. I spent four and a half years in your country. Where? I worked in New York and before that attended college in New Jersey. Yes, you're right. It was Princeton. Quite a guess, I must say. What did I think of Princeton? Well, the answer to that question requires a story. When I first arrived, I looked around me at the Gothic buildings, younger, I later learned, than many of the moths of this city, but made through acid treatment and ingenious stone masonry to look older, and thought, this is a dream come true. Princeton inspired in me the feeling that my life was a film in which I was the star and everything was possible. I have access to this beautiful campus, I thought, to professors who are titans in their fields and fellow students who are philosopher kings in the making. I was, I must admit, overly generous in my initial assumptions about the standard of the student body. They were almost all intelligent and many were brilliant, but whereas I was one of only two Pakistanis in my entering class, two from a population of over a hundred million souls, mind you, the Americans faced much less daunting odds in the selection process. A thousand of your compatriots were enrolled, 500 times as many, even though your country's population was only twice that of mine. As a result, the non-Americans among us tended, on average, to do better than the Americans. And in my case, I reached my senior year without having received a single B. Looking back now, I see the power of that system, pragmatic and effective, like so much else in America. We international students were sourced from around the globe, assisted not only by well-honed standardized tests, but by painstakingly customized evaluations, interviews, essays, recommendations, until the best and brightest of us had been identified. I myself had among the top exam results in Pakistan and was besides a soccer player good enough to compete on the varsity team, which I did until I damaged my knee in my sophomore year. Students like me were given visas and scholarships, complete financial aid, mind you, and invited into the ranks of the meritocracy. In return, we were expected to contribute our talents to your society the society we were joining, and for the most part, 
we were happy to do so. I certainly was, at least at first. Every form, Princeton raised her skirt for the corporate recruiters who came onto campus and, as you say in America, showed them some skin. The skin Princeton showed was good skin, of course, young, eloquent, and clever as can be, but even among all that skin, I knew in my senior year that I was something special. I was a perfect breast, tan, succulent, seemingly defiant of gravity, and I was confident of getting any job I wanted. Except one, Underwood Sampson and Company. You have not heard of them? They were a valuation firm. They told their clients how much businesses were worth, and they did so, it was said, with a precision that was uncanny. They were small, a boutique, really, employing a bare minimum of people, and they paid well, offering the fresh graduate a base salary of over $80,000. But more importantly, they gave one a robust set of skills and an exalted brand name. So exalted, in fact, that after two or three years there as an analyst, one was virtually guaranteed admission to Harvard Business School. Because of this, over 100 members of the Princeton class of 2001 sent their grades and resumes to Underwood Sampson. Eight were selected, not for jobs, I should make clear, but for interviews. And one of them was me. You seem worried. Do not be. This burly fellow is merely our waiter, and there's no need to reach under your jacket, I assume, to grasp your wallet, as we will pay him later when we're done. Would you prefer regular tea with milk and sugar, or green tea, or perhaps a more fragrant specialty, Kashmiri tea? Excellent choice. I will have the same, and perhaps a plate of jalebis as well. There, he is gone. I must admit, he is a rather intimidating chap, but irreproachably polite. You would have been surprised by the sweetness of his speech, if only you understood Urdu. And then a short passage from a bit further on. <clears throat> I was telling you about the moment when I was forced to stare. We were lying on the beach, and many of the European women nearby were, as usual, sunbathing topless, a practice I wholeheartedly supported, but which the women among us Princetonians, unfortunately, had thus far failed to embrace, when I noticed Erica was untying the straps of her bikini. And then, as I watched, only an arm's length away, she bared her breasts to the sun. A moment later, no, you're right, I'm being dishonest, it was more than a moment, she turned her head to the side and saw me staring at her. A number of possible alternatives presented themselves. I could suddenly avert my eyes, thereby proving not only that I had been staring, but that I was uncomfortable with what I saw. I could, after a brief pause, casually move my gaze away, as though the sight of her breast had been the most natural thing in the world. I could keep staring, honestly communicating in this way my admiration for what she had revealed. Or I could, through well-timed literary illusion, draw her attention to the fact that there was a passage in Mr. Palomar that captured perfectly my dilemma. But I did none of these things. Instead, I blushed and said, Hello. She smiled with uncharacteristic shyness, it seemed to me, and replied, Hi. I nodded, tried to think of something else to say, failed, and said, Hello, again. <laughs> as soon as I had done this, I wanted to disappear. I knew I sounded unbelievably foolish. She started to laugh, her small breasts bouncing, and said, I'm going for a swim. But then, as she walked away, she half turned and added, You want to come? I followed her watching the muscles of her lower back tense delicately to stabilize her spine. We reached the water. It was warm and perfectly clear, round pebbles and a flash of little fish visible below the surface. We slipped inside. She swam out into the bay with powerful strokes, then she trod water until I'd caught up with her. For a time, we were both silent, and I felt our slippery legs graze each other as we churned the sea. I don't think, she said finally, I've ever met someone our age as polite as you. Polite, I said, less than radiant with joy. She smiled. I don't mean it that way. She said, not boring polite, respectful polite. You give people their space. I really like that. It's unusual. We continued bobbing face to face, and I formed the impression that she was waiting for me to say something in reply, but words had abandoned me. Instead, my thoughts were engaged in a struggle to maintain a facial expression that would not appear idiotic. 
She turned and began to swim back to shore, keeping her head above water. I pulled alongside and, claiming victory at last over my cowering tongue, said, Shall we return to town for a drink? To which she replied, with a raised eyebrow and in an accent not normally her own, I would be delighted to do so, sir. Thank you. <laughs>